Hey everyone, it's Alexi Uzas here from Exile Entertainment. In this video, I'm going to tell you how I produced my first feature film, Plague, and sold it to Netflix. Now before I get started, I want to let you know that spots are available for our Producing Accelerator program that helps filmmakers like you consistently finance and produce your films and we've helped multiple filmmakers finance and produce their debut feature film. So if you're interested in learning more, stick around until the, the end of this video. And for the best filmmaking advice, make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell to be notified when we post a video. So the way that my debut feature film came about was that I had just finished university. My brother who was at film school finished uh, in the same year. And so by around the start of the following year, we had decided that we wanted to make a feature film. So we had made short films together up until that point in time. Um, I'd gone and made some other short films. He'd obviously worked on other people's short films um, at film school. But for us, it seemed like the next logical step, right? We had made short films. We felt like we'd cut our teeth. Um, we didn't want to keep making short films. We wanted to be making feature films so for us it seemed like the obvious step was to go out there and make a feature film easier said than done um, but we learned that in time so you know at that point that we decided that that's what we wanted to do we started to think about how we might be able to do that um, who we might be able to work with to help make it happen. Fortunately, my brother at the time uh, had a friend from film school who was also really, um, really eager to make his first feature film as well. And at the time, he was running a um, a commercial uh, business, making content and, and making commercials for brands and businesses and that sort of thing. And he had a business partner and they were both kind of really eager to make their first uh, feature film as well. Four of us got together, um, decided that yes, this is something that we all wanted to do. And so we kind of laid the groundwork uh, for for that to happen. Very first thing that we did was start to put together a timeline for how um, we might be able to move a project through development, through financing and into production. That's something that took a bit of time, I think, to really work out how it would happen because at that point we didn't even have an idea. We had kind of no idea what, what type of film that we would make, but we knew that you know there would be a window to shoot the film um, in January um, because January is a typically a kind of um, a slow time for, for crew, um, particularly in Australia. And so we thought that that could be a kind of window of opportunity where we could make the film, um, still be able to find crew. Some of us were working full time, like myself, I was working at a law firm. It was also a time that I knew that I would have leave. I would have vacation time. So I'd be able to go and, and shoot the film during that time. Once we knew that that was going to be roughly the time that we would shoot, we knew then we had um, you know, the better part of a year, I think by this time that we'd all met up and kind of decided that we were going to do it, it was around March or April. So it gave us, yeah, about eight months to kind of get everything ready. My brother was very much into drama or dramatic writing and the uh, director that he was friends with was really into horror. And they decided that they would co-direct the film. And so it became obvious pretty quickly that the film would be a horror film. Um, and that's the direction that we would go in. Obviously, horror lending itself to really low budget production um, and low budget filmmaking. Uh, it seemed like a good choice for us as well. So from there, what happened it was it was probably a three to four to maybe even five month development period. Um, my brother writing, so first outlines, um, then of course onto the screenplay, sending those drafts to us, everyone giving feedback, us having get togethers, probably I think at that time we might've been meeting say once a month um, or once every three to four weeks in person and the rest would all be via kind of emails or phone calls uh, and that sort of thing. But it was really just kind of blocking out that time to focus on um, developing the screenplay and then giving ourselves, you know, another kind of four months to just get everything ready, get finance in place um, and get the film into production. 
So when it came time to work out how the hell we we're going to finance this project, we decided that we would self-finance the film ourselves. And the reason that we did that is because each of us had equally no idea how to raise finance for a film. I never went to film school. Uh, I'd never done any short courses. So I had absolutely no idea. Um, even my brother and the co-director who went to film school didn't learn how to finance films. So we were really clueless about how you could just go out there and find finance that would finance your film. Um, we also knew that even though there are agencies in Australia that provide soft money to finance films, given we had no track record, um, we realized that it would be pretty difficult for us to be able to raise finance that way. So we just bit the bullet and said, okay, let's self finance it ourselves. And so what we did is we came up with a rough budget pretty early on in the process, um, particularly once we'd kind of been through that first development period and we had a draft, um, we started to work out you know, what a budget might look like. Uh, and then we started to come up with a plan for how we would self-finance it. So the way that we did it um, was that we split the investment equally. So each of us would contribute the same amount, um, but we were really flexible about how that investment would come in and where it would come in. And the reason that we were flexible is that each of us had completely different ways of generating income. So at the time I was working at a law firm. Um, so my pay was kind of weekly. Uh, although, you know, in Australia, lawyers don't make much in their first year. I think my salary was around 45000 for the year. Um, so for me, it was important that I kept living at home as well and kept my expenses to a real minimum, which obviously, you know, not everyone can do. Um, and I was fortunate that, that I was able to do that, but that allowed me to save money and kind of funnel the wage that I was working, uh, earning from the law firm into the film. For the co-director, you know, he was running a business, so he had more consistent cash flow. For my brother, he was just setting up um, an online business at the time. So, you know, he had probably less cash flow at the start, but then towards the end, he was really the kind of um, financing um, or at kind of contributing more at that time because he hadn't contributed as much at the start. So we really did leave it flexible in that way um, because we understood that each of us had completely different income streams. We decided on the budget figure. It ended up being, I think we set it at 120. It ended up going to 140 for the whole film um, from, you know, coming up with or deciding to make the film to then the film being released. That was around a probably almost 20. 20 to 22 month period so being able to consistently contribute funds to the project over that period of time actually ended up being a really good way to do it rather than just trying to raise all the money at the start which of course we couldn't because we didn't know how and we didn't have that type of money ourselves so we came up with this way to just we would just keep contributing keep basically financing the project as we went and given we were self-financing it you know all the risk was with us so we weren't putting any investors risk money at risk so that's how we did it and we basically all just contributed that equal amount over that period of time so the next step was for us to get the film into production and actually make this thing so we took inspiration from robert rodriguez's rebel without a crew and basically just tried to use as many resources as we could from friends and family so the film being a horror film was one location uh, we decided that we would shoot that on a farm so that we had like complete control of the environment. Um, a friend of ours had a property with a shed on it. Um, so we decided that the shed would be the main location. Um, interestingly, up until that point in time in the script, it was actually a, a house. Um, but once we found the shed and we knew we had access to it and that there was no one around, we had really kind of control of that environment. Uh, we decided that, that that would be the location and so we went back to the script and then made changes to adapt it uh, and make sure that it then fit the new location that was something that was really useful um, i remember for my brother who wrote the script found that extremely useful you know knowing the location ahead of time then allowed him to really write that into the script so we had the lo main location sorted we then, being out of Melbourne, needed to sort out accommodation. So we managed to um, get accommodation on the top of a ski mountain. Um, but given we were shooting in uh, summer, uh, that that mountain was typically pretty empty. There weren't many people around. Uh, so we managed to get accommodation there where we could house all the cast and crew together, um, which was great because you know over that period, being away from the city, 
um, for almost everyone on set. It was their first feature film. Being able to spend that time bonding, building a culture, even just driving up and down the mountain every day to and from set created a really good atmosphere. Um, as producer, I was the one, of course, always always driving uh, driving the minivan. But even looking back now, you know, it was it was a really great experience, and being able to do that with a team the whole time um, was really beneficial. So yeah, we just begged and borrowed everything that we could from memory the cinematographer had a camera you know the sandy had had his own equipment so we were able to really just pull all these resources that we could as well as the finance that we were contributing and that allowed us to to produce the film and um, we shot it over 14 days so it was a really fast shoot from memory i think i even ad'd the shoot because um, again we were just trying to like limit the amount of crew roles that we had it was the middle of summer in australia so it was super hot we were in a shed so it was even hotter i think the temperatures were hitting like 40 on some days and the camera got so hot at one point that we had to put ice packs on it to cool it down uh, but it was a really great experience and going through that production um, one of the absolute kind of key rewards or takeaways was that it gave me the confidence to then keep producing films you know when you haven't made a feature film it does seem like this extremely daunting task which it is you know it is a challenge it is a step up from making short films but once you've done it it really takes away that mystique and that mystery and, and it doesn't become it doesn't feel daunting anymore you don't have that fear that's associated with it so i remember once uh, when i met the filmmaker who would make um, my second film uh, and his first film at the time, West of Sunshine, I knew I wanted to work with him. I knew I wanted to work on the film. And I was able to just launch into it because I'd already made my first film. I knew what that was like and I wasn't scared or daunted by it. One of the really important things about making a feature film is that it builds that confidence. It gives you the knowledge. It gives you some experience. It gives you some new skills that you can use to help you then continue to make feature films. So that was absolutely the most important aspect of making my first feature film was just doing it, you know, because then, like I said, it gave me that confidence to move on to the next ones. I remember, you know, the last day of the shoot, it was a Sunday, sun was coming down, it was magic hour, got the film, got it all in the can, it was amazing, high fives all around, had to drive back to the mountain, like 30 or 40 minutes up the mountain, pack up everything. So I got back home, back to Melbourne, just before midnight, absolutely exhausted, but thrilled by what we uh, achieved. Went to sleep, alarm went off the next morning, suited up, back to work, um, and back in court that very day. So it was also a real crash landing back to earth and back to reality, which is just one of the parts of making films independently, and especially when you're starting out. You can really ride these highs when you're making the film and you're doing something that you're absolutely passionate about and you want to be doing to then crashing back to reality and, of course, needing to go to work and needing to generate an income. And that's really just part of the process. And so if you're ever going through that, you know, that riding the high to then going back to the monotony of daily life or um, going back to work, it is just part of the process and something that you do just get used to. Well, once we'd finished the film, it was time to decide what we would do with it, how we would distribute the film. And again, being totally green to the process, uh, especially with me, again, having never been to film school, never made um, films, uh, feature films before, we really weren't exactly sure what the next step was. Um, we knew that we would have to find a distributor, find a sales agent, you know, we'd heard these terms, um, but we really didn't understand what it all meant. One of the things that was really useful to me over this whole period was having a mentor. So there was an entertainment lawyer in Melbourne who was kind enough to, you know, give me time every two or three months, catch up for a coffee and basically just give me pointers as I was going along. And so at each stage, he would kind of give me some tips or tell me what was coming or what I needed to be thinking about. And that was something that was absolutely vital to me. A, just knowing that I was going in roughly the right direction um, and B, just giving me some level of comfort and confidence that I was on the right track. So um, seeking out mentorship during this process, especially if it's your first feature films, absolutely essential and something that I can't high, that I can't recommend enough. So when it got to distribution, you know, he said these these are the things that you should be thinking about. He also put me in touch with a more experienced producer who came on board um, and actually did some consulting for us. So again, kind of top 
gave us some feedback on the film, told us who should we be speaking to, um, when we should approach them, these sorts of things. So that was all a really kind of important part of the process and was really the first opportunity for me to learn about that side of the business. One of the things that we did, um, which looking back now was um, kind of crazy and a bit of a mistake, was that um, we decided that we wanted to do a big premiere for the film because like, who doesn't, right? You've made your first feature film, let's get everyone down and, and do a big premiere. We booked out a cinema in Melbourne, which is like this old Art Deco cinema, the Astor Theatre. It's absolutely great cinema, um, one of the best, um, probably in the country, and it seats like 800 people. So we just decided, well, we'll just make it free. Like everyone can come, we'll pack the place out and it'll be awesome, <laughs> which it was, but we made absolutely no money from it. So um, looking back, I still think it is a mistake. I mean, as good as that night was and as fun as it was and like if we were charging, maybe we wouldn't have hit eight, 800 people because we absolutely packed the place out. If we were charging $20 a ticket, you know, that would have been like 16 grand of income right there. And obviously there was the cinema hire cost, but still it would have been a decent chunk of money um, and would have allowed us to start recouping our initial investment. So that was one of the first mistakes that we made, um, probably just being from overexcited and overly um, kind of enthusiastic about the whole thing and just wanting to show everyone um, the film that we'd produced. From there, the focus became about trying to find a sales agent. So I started pitching it out to sales agents. Um, again, just started to find out who were the sales agents um, through the consultant that we brought on. They were obviously able to give us some names and contact details. And so I managed to get onto a sales agent um, at the time, it was near, I think, Christmas of the following year. So we shot it in Jan. It was now kind of Christmas of the following of that year, sorry. So kind of like 11 months later. I happened to travel to New York that year and thought, well, why don't I just try and set up some meetings with the sales agents that are in New York and managed to actually meet with one of them at that time and, and basically come to an agreement um, to sell the rights, the international rights to them while we met with them. A couple of interesting things out of that process. The first one is that um, I was told by many people, um, mentors, lawyers, consultants, that it wouldn't be likely that we would um, be able to get an advance from a sales agent. So I went into that meeting with really low expectations and it became clear that we would actually be able to get an MG during that meeting. But I absolutely know now looking back that I undersold and myself and undersold the film. So I think the MG was around 15,000 US, which we were ecstatic about at the time. Even the people that we were dealing with, like our lawyers thought it was a great deal and we should take it. But looking back and knowing more about negotiating and knowing more about distribution, I'm sure that we undersold ourselves um, at that time. The other thing was that it's possible as well that we were also just, again, overly kind of over eager to sign on a sales agent. So at that point, not that many sales agents had seen the film. I certainly hadn't met with that many sales agents. It was um, definitely a case of taking one of the first deals that came to us, and even within that deal, one of the um, one of the first kind of um, offers that were made. So that was a learning experience for me. Obviously, we were still absolutely um, stoked to have a sales agent and for them to be um, representing the film so that sales agent is actually the one that sold the film to netflix so at the time netflix was really just coming into its own as a streamer and so they were actually the one to do the deal with netflix for the u.s territory so it wasn't a, a worldwide deal um, but they sold the film to netflix and i talk about this a lot both in my videos and also of course through the accelerator with the filmmakers that i work with that teaming up with or working with a sales agent is really, really important for you as a producer or a filmmaker because it's really hard, if not impossible, to do the job as a sales agent while also producing films. Having that relationship in place is really important because those are the types of people, sales agents or companies that can then really exploit your film through different territories or deals with streaming platforms. I learned that lesson the hard way on my second film. I actually tried to do kind of what a typical sales agent would do. I know that it didn't get the reach that it could have if we had a really good experienced sales agent on board. So now, you know, from that 
kind of experience onwards. Working with sales agents is something that's high priority for me as a as a producer. And so really now it's just about finding the right ones, trying to get the best deals and forming those ongoing relationships. Another reason that's important, I just want to drop this into this video, is that it allows you to then really just focus on making the film the best that it can be. And once the film's finished, it allows you to focus on marketing and promoting the film and then also allows you to keep working on the next film, right? Keep the next film in development or keep developing the next one, trying to get that one financed and into production rather than spending all this time trying to sell the film yourself. So that was our experience on the sales agent side. And then we managed to get an Australian distributor and they released the film um, predominantly through DVD. So at the time, Exile had just, I think I'd started the company just as first film was being finished. So we did a portion of the distribution and then we teamed up with a distributor as well that did the DVD side. So we did all the online, we did the festivals, we did um, some theatrical and we did all the promoting and all the marketing. And then we had another distributor do I think the DVD and any ancillary sales. So that's how we that's how we distributed the film. I want to leave you with a few key lessons or takeaways from my experience making my debut feature film. The first is don't listen to the naysayers. And obviously this is something that is spoken about not just in the film industry, but in many industries. But I think it's important, particularly in the film industry, when you're making your first feature film. It's something that is extremely challenging. You know, you're doing something that is far beyond your level of experience at that point in time. It's daunting. And also it's something that everyone wants to do. So if you're doing it, it's going to be easy for people to also even just subconsciously get jealous or envious that you are actually doing it. And so it's easy for them to kind of try to talk you out of doing it or give you reasons why you shouldn't do it. And even if that envy or jealousy doesn't exist, they will still doubt that you'll be able to do what you're trying to do. I remember with this first film, um, I got to a point where I thought that it would be helpful to have another producer on board um, going into production. And so I remember sending the project to a producer um, that we knew and all the material that I'd put together and hoping that they would come on board. And their response was that I was biting off more than I could chew and that I wasn't going to be able to do it and that the whole production was just going to implode. If I'd listened to that person at that time, if I'd started to doubt myself, um, if I'd lost confidence in what I was going to do, it really would have derailed either me or all the project or the project never would have gone ahead. And if I hadn't made that first film, I never would have made the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth. So it's really important that you absolutely don't listen to those types of people and there will be those types of people if you're trying to do something that's challenging in life. The second thing is that it's not going to go perfectly. Um, even in this video, I've given you some of the mistakes um, that happened, probably many more that I, that I can't recall at this time. I'm sure there were. So it's not going to go perfectly. It's not going to go exactly to plan. But that's fine because the important thing is that you actually make the film, that you go through that experience and that you learn any lessons that need to be learned. And that leads me to my third and by far my most important piece of advice. And I think this is one of the most important pieces of advice I could give just across the board for any aspiring filmmaker is that if you make the first feature film and it doesn't go exactly as planned, you know, if it doesn't end up at Cannes, if it doesn't become a huge commercial success, which every filmmaker goes into that first film expecting, if it doesn't do those things, you can't let it dishearten you or you can't let it be, you can't let yourself become disillusioned because that first film is really meant to be there as a kind of testing ground and as a learning process for you to go through to then be able to make your second and third and fourth films. That's really the purpose of that first film. The films that add up at Khan that become huge commercial successes, those are the outliers. And so you shouldn't compare yourselves to those films and you absolutely shouldn't get disheartened if your first film doesn't do those things. I've certainly seen it ha happen to filmmakers and it's something that I really, yeah, I just can't stress it enough because 
if you want to be a filmmaker, you have to continue making feature films. And the only way to do that, if it doesn't go your way or doesn't go exactly as you'd planned, is just to pick yourself up and go straight into the next one. Okay, so that's it for this video. I hope you liked the video. If you did, leave some comments in the comments section below. I'd love to hear about some of the trials and tribulations of making your first feature film. And if you haven't made your first feature film, let me know about what are some of the things that you're struggling with or that is kind of holding you back from making that film. Of course, if you liked the video, hit the like button and do make sure you subscribe to this channel. Now, if you're interested in working with us at Exile to help you produce your debut feature film, or even if you've made your debut and you're working on the next one, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and you want help if you want to work with a more experienced company that can help you get that film up and get it into production head to the link in the description below where you'll be able to set up a time to speak with either me or a member of my team and we'll work out whether you're the right fit for the accelerator and whether we can help you get your film into production and as always check out these videos next on how to up your filmmaking game